Thank you. So many of you are aware that we're living in an unsettled times. In many societies throughout the world, we have a feeling that there's increased polarization on the political level. And this is particularly true in the United States, where I come from, where you may be aware that the long simmering culture wars of the last 20 years threaten to boil over under the current president. Now, when people try to come up with a, a reason for why this polarization is taking place, you more and more will hear the argument that uh, at the root, there are really two embittered worldviews that are engaged in a struggle. On the one hand, secular liberalism, and the, on the other, uh, conservative or religious conservatism. So I want to talk to you tonight about worldview. This is a very versatile term. It's a term that uh, is creeping up more and more in the media. Uh, what makes it so unusual, I think, is that it's able to convey both a scientific, rational understanding, religious belief, and political passion, all three of those at the same time. Uh, it seems that there's no other term that, that is quite as adequate for describing both uh, confrontations with radical Islamism and also struggles within the United States between Republicans and Democrats. So uh, I do want to talk about worldview, but I'll let you know straight off that I'm quite suspicious of the term worldview. Uh, I think that if I uh, pose the question, what's in a worldview, my first answer would be hidden assumptions. And what I want to explore with you tonight are what are the, the hidden assumptions that have been deposited in worldview over the course of its 200 year history. So I'm gonna take a brief uh, journey through the history of worldview and try to uncover some of these assumptions with the aim not that you will come away with feeling I now know what my worldview is, but rather I want you to question the very idea of worldview. That's my aim. Uh, I want to uh, offer you two uh, particular points of, of entry into this topic. On the one hand, I want to explore the ways in which secular and religious actors have uh, contributed to the invention of worldview, but also have propelled its development over time. And I think what's interesting is that there are also hidden dialogues that go on between religious and secular actors through the term worldview. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is the merger of politics and worldview. Um, if we talk about rise and fall of worldview, we can say that under national socialism, there is a rise of worldview in the 20th century, and that in the uh, United States of the Cold War, there's the fall of worldview. And now that we're re-entering a rise of worldview, the question is, what does the history tell us, or how can it help us? Uh, the first point we have to talk about is the origin of worldview. Now, worldview is not a concept that has already always existed. I want you not to assume that just because it makes intuitive sense to us that we have a worldview, right? Everyone sees the world in a certain way. But the, the idea of worldview was, was invented in the 19th century, and it was invented in Germany, and it comes from the term Weltanschauung. Now, two things occurred in Germany at that time to give rise to worldview. The first thing was a revolution in natural science. Uh, we heard earlier about the scientific revolution of the Renaissance, but what happens in the 19th century in Germany is that a group of natural scientists believe that it is possible to give a total description of the world from a few basic principles. And here we see Alexander von Humboldt, a German explorer and naturalist who writes a book called uh, Cosmos, which is an attempt really at a first rough draft of this total history of the world through natural science. And uh, one of the key elements of this worldview is the notion of evolution. So already before Darwin, the Germans had, had latched onto the idea of evolution. And evolution provides a total model for all human life. It all derives and emerges and, and uh, develops further through evolution, the evolutionary process. And here we see the tree of life from a German author from the mid-19th century. Um, essentially, it shows the totality of, of biological life in a single diagram. That is worldview, and this is a, a worldview author. The second thing that happens is that this total understanding of the world gets mobilized against religion. 
What happens is that the advocates of this new natural scientific worldview argue that it has replaced the old worldview of Christianity. Um, in the process of replacing Christianity, advocates of the new worldview believe that it takes on also the attributes previously held by Christianity. It provides a morality, it provides an explanation of where we come from and where we're going, and it provides meaning for life. And here we see a painting of a revolutionary of 1848, Robert Bloom. He was an advocate of the new worldview, also uh, engaged in the revolution, and here he's about to be executed for his, his participation in the revolution. And you'll notice he's raised up his hand against the Catholic priest. He himself was a Catholic my background, but he had now converted to the new worldview. And the message is, I don't need Christianity. I'm secure in my secular worldview, even at the moment of death. Okay, so natural scientific worldview is essentially the first dominant worldview in Germany. Now, if you look online at a online bookseller, you will find, if you type in worldview into the title search, you will come up with something like a thousand titles, maybe, maybe more. Of those, the majority are written by advocates of religious worldview. In other words, they're still propagating worldview as something they want, aspire to and that we should follow. And th within that group, the, by far the most numerous are advocates of what is known as Christian worldview. Now, Christian worldview uh, authors are largely white evangelicals from the United States. So that's an interesting fact. How is it that a term originating in secularism is now most actively propagated by the most conservative branch of Protestantism in the United States? To understand that transition, we'll have to go back uh, to the period around 1900. And we now get a Dutch element to our story. Uh, there's a famous, uh, uh, famous theologian and politician, Abraham Cowper. He said that the enemy had a, had a vast army and that it had lined up a formation, a fearsome formation on the battle line. It had science, universities, political parties, and they were all united by worldview. What Christians needed was to match one for one the battle formation of the enemy, and Cowper founded a university, and they needed to unite it with what? With worldview. So he became an advocate of Christian worldview in the year 1900, around then. Now, uh, this is a, a picture, I believe, from the United States. Cowper was very influential in American uh, circles, Protestant circles, particularly fundamentalists. And they took Cowper's idea of Christian worldview and developed out of it a, a very intelligent defense of the Bible. What they said was that in the past, uh, Christians used to try to defend the Bible when attacked by non-believers um, on a kind of one-by-one -one basis. They would, if the non-believer would argue about miracles, Christians would argue about miracles. You know, creation in seven days, right? People that, that have uh, knowledge of geology and so on would say, ha ha, can't possibly be true, therefore the Bible is not true. So the argument from worldview was, uh, the important thing when reading the Bible is your mindset with which you read it. If you're a Christian, you are reading essentially a different Bible than the non-believer. Uh, so that's worldview, right? The Christian worldview uh, gives you different presuppositions and necessarily leads to different conclusions. You see a different reality. So the argument is that uh, secular and Christian worldviews cannot communicate with one another. They are, they are separate and they must remain separate in the interest of Christianity. So that's Christian worldview. Now what's interesting, to sum up my first point tonight, is that uh, we see that secular worldview is only possible out of a critique of religion. But that Christian worldview, or religion worldview in general, if you use the term worldview, is really derived from secularism, okay? In some of its key assumptions, obviously not in its theology. So th that's quite an interesting fact. There, there's a mutual dependence, if you so will, on both of these understandings of worldview as revealed in history. And I think actually there's some hope in the contemporary culture wars for some type of dialogue on that basis. All right, now we come to our second point, which is the merger of politics and worldview in the 20th century. Whoops, 
Oh, okay, so here, here is an image of American uh, uh, famous evangelical, I think this is Billy Graham, um, as a representative of the American embrace of Christian worldview. Now, when we talk about political worldview, uh, we need to mention Adolf Hitler, because uh, National Socialism was in many ways the absolute high point of the development of worldview. Hitler never spoke or rarely spoke of National Socialism as a philosophy or an ideology, but always as a Weltanschauung, as a worldview. And he made an interesting innovation in the thinking about worldview in the process. He said that the other people who talk about worldview, the Christians and the secularists, they make a mistake they always derive their idea of worldview from the truth, okay? They believe that truth is what makes worldview great. Hitler said, no, what makes worldview great is its ability to unite the nation. So the test of the worldview as an ideal is its ability to unite the nation against its enemies. And for Hitler, that was uh, communists and Jews. So Hitler looked back in history and said, when was Germany last united by a worldview? properly. He said, medieval Christianity. The medieval church managed it. But then the Reformation came along, separated Protestants from Catholics, and, world, and religion from that point on became what divided Germans rather than united them. So Hitler said, if Germany is going to be reunited, it has to be reunited under a secular worldview, one that can fight Marxism. And that's what he offered as National Socialism. So we can say that the rise of worldview, the zenith of worldview, is National Socialism. The Second World War, in many ways, is a war of worldviews, right? Certainly as far as, as Marxism and National Socialism are concerned. But what of the third party to the conflict in Europe, right? What about the liberal democracies, the United States and the UK? Do they have a worldview, right? Uh, is liberal democracy a worldview? It's an important question, especially today. Now, at the end of the, um, at the end of the Cold, uh, the, sorry, at the beginning of the Cold War, there were a group of American and European liberal intellectuals who pondered this question. And they said that the answer is no. Liberal democracy does not have a worldview. Moreover, the lack of a worldview in liberal democracy is what makes liberal democracy superior to all other political systems. So the, um, what they said was that America, in particular, had a specific intellectual tradition, which had, on the one hand, pluralism, and on the other, pragmatism. So what that meant in the political realm was that you would have a multitude of voices, pluralism, but they had to then engage in some kind of dialogue or, or debate or a scientific investigation to arrive at pragmatic solutions um, to pragmatic understandings of truth at the end. And they argued that that was the very antithesis of worldview, right? Worldview is a total system of explanation. Pragmatism, pluralism are the antithesis. They were so confident of their position that in the year 1960, a book was published called The End of Ideology. And it also clearly refers to the end of worldview. So they believed worldview was over in 1960, okay? And here's an image of, of uh, I don't know what this is, I'm gonna guess Hungary, 1956, toppling a statue of Stalin. But in a sense, the, the sense of these Cold War liberals was that they had toppled those worldviews. Okay, what does this teach us about America today? Okay, I'm, I'm American. I'm, focusing on the United States here. Uh, but I think that's where these debates about worldview are most intense at present. So um, what is the lesson of, of this historical tour for today in the United States? Now, one of the things similar to the notion of Christian worldview, that worldviews are separate and not supposed to mesh, not supposed to arrive at some kind of common ground. Um, it's not far from there to go to alternative facts. Now, you may be aware of this statement that was made by the uh, uh, press, uh, the, the spokeswoman of Trump in January of this year, that Trump was offering alternative facts um, on, in some dispute. Now, alternative facts, of course, got a laugh at the time, and some people were very irritated at this. 
Um, but it does make sense from the point of view of worldview, right? Because worldviews have alternative facts because they have alternative realities. The other place we could look and say uh, worldview thinking is at work is the debate over climate change. Um, many uh, conservatives who reject climate change in the United States are not looking to engage in a serious scientific debate over climate change, but rather insist on the importance of the validity of their perspective, right? Which is, again, worldview thinking at work. So, uh, to conclude, I think that um, there's a point to be made by uh, people that think with worldviews that uh, the liberal press, or liberals in general, are sometimes a bit blind to their own ideological position, um, and they tend to assume that their position is shared by everybody. Okay, that is a good, valid criticism. However, when you start to talk in terms of worldview, uh, uh, dialogue tends to end. Uh, and I do believe, following the Cold War liberals, that worldview talk is bad for democracy. Because, why? Well, th the Cold War liberals said that pluralism is good, but you can't, it's not the end point. It's not enough to just say there are two sides to every issue. You have to also connect pluralism to some kind of pragmatic search for a solution to problems or for some type of compromise. And to my thinking, whenever worldview is invoked, dialogue ends. Um, and, and for that reason, I want you, uh, would be my, my uh, uh, suggestion, that before you use worldview the next time, you stop to consider the assumptions that go along with that term. And the key assumption, I believe, is that thought that worldviews cannot engage in dialogue, right? But, but my belief or my hope is that uh, we can engage in dialogue, and I, th I think that that is uh, what is needed at the current moment. Thank you.